Good afternoon, I'm Robert Dakota. I had a lot more to say, it's gonna get shortened down. <laughs> um, we had a really great time with Graham today out on the land and uh, it was really nice to have some time to hang with him. I really appreciate his energy. He has been pushing so hard and I've been observing this from a distance. I wanna tell you this man works really, really hard to come here and present this information to you and Dr. Rick Strassman, Rick Strassman, MD, has been invited by Graham, and um, they're going to have a conversation tonight, and I think you're really going to enjoy it. So without further ado, I'll leave it to Graham and Rick. Thank you, guys. Good, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Thank you all so much for being here. Uh, I have the incredible privilege of sitting with one of my psychedelic heroes, Dr. Rick Strassman, whose remarkable research on DMT and his book, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, and subsequent books, and his film, DMT, The Spirit Molecule, have, I think, uh, changed the world and are continuing to do so. Okay, so please meet Rick Strassman. Um, Rick, I'm going, to, I'm going to start at the beginning. You, uh, you undertook I would, what I regard as one of the most extraordinary uh, research projects in science that's perhaps ever been undertaken, and it was an exploration uh, of an unknown land, in a way. Um, but uh, I'm, I, I think I and, and the audience would be interested in hearing a little bit of your, your personal story your, your, your childhood, uh, what motivated you, how you, how you became a, a, a psychiatrist, how you came to the University of New Mexico. Tell us a little bit about, about your biography. Okay, well, thanks everybody for coming. This is the first public uh, presentation or appearance I've made in a few years. You know, so I have to hand it um, to Graham to you know, bulldozed me out of my little cave in Gallup, New Mexico to, you know, come here uh, for this event, but I'm really, you know, glad to be here. Um, well, uh, as far as my upbringing, um, my grandparents came to the U.S. in the early 1900s from the Pale of Settlement, uh, which was, you know, the only place in Europe and in Western Russia where the Jews could live. And uh, there were pogroms in the early 1900s, uh, and you know, millions of Jews fled from the Pale of Settlement and ended up mostly in the U.S. and Canada. Uh, so my parents were first-generation Americans, uh, and they started off on the East Coast, migrated to the West Coast for school. Um, and I was born in Los Angeles, raised in the San Fernando Valley uh, in the you know, 50s and 60s. Uh, it was quite a pleasant place to live back then, orange groves and beach culture and Hollywood and uh, you know, mostly fresh air. I mean, we used to burn our garbage in these incinerators in our backyards, uh, which kind of kindled, so to speak, you know, my interest in you know, uh, you know, fire, explosions, heat, those, those kinds of things. Um, and at an early age, I actually became quite interested in you know, chemistry, you know, for the colors, but um, you know, mostly for the fireworks. Uh, you could buy chemicals at the local drugstore, like saltpeter and sulfur and things to make you know gunpowder with. Uh, so I, you know, began as a you know, fireworks you know, teenager uh, and actually began college as a chemistry major because uh, I wanted to become a fireworks magnate. Uh, and everybody discouraged me, um, you know, telling me I was a smart guy and ought to become a doctor. You know, but I got the last laugh uh, because I ended up studying psychedelics. Um, <laughs> um, well, let's see. I went to you know college in the late you know in uh, the late 1960s, early 1970s. 
Um, and it was a uh, well in in California, and uh, it was interesting, you know, time culturally for a number of reasons. One of which, you know, was the influx of you know two technologies that could reliably alter consciousness, which had just you know, kind of entered the scene, both you know psychedelics and Eastern meditation, and uh, they both you know seem to be reliable. Um, you know, uh, uh, you know, techniques, you know, to alter consciousness. Um, the descriptions of what occurred during certain meditations and during certain drug states resembled each other, you know, to some extent. And, you know, being a uh, you know, chemistry buff, I was, uh, you know, thinking there, uh, you know, must be, you know, some you know, common biological denominators in both states, you know, to the extent that they resembled each other. Um, and uh, I was interested in investigating those you know, similarities. Were there, um, were there you know, centers in the brain which were activated when you took LSD and when you took, or when you practiced specific you know, kinds of meditation? Um, and I, you know, went to medical school. Well, I, you know, applied to medical school. I, I actually applied to 21 medical schools, and I was, you know, keen on studying you know, psychedelics, Buddhism, and you know, psychoanalytic psychology. But, you know, but I was only 20 years old, and uh, you know, when I was. Uh, when I was doing all of these interviews, you know, for medical schools. You know, usually um, the first you know, question is, why do you want to be a doctor? And I told them, and I was rejected by 19 of them. <laughs> uh, so the two schools I got into, you know, one was about a three-minute interview, and I didn't you know, have a chance you know, to tell them. And uh, the, other, um, the other was, uh, I think they felt sorry for me. Uh, and they you know, put me on their waiting list. Um, you know, so um, I started, you know, medical school kind of in a weird state. Like I, you know, uh, you know that isn't why people go to medical school. Um, and I got depressed and you know dropped out for about a year, and I ended up at a Zen temple, uh, a, a Buddhist monastery, um, and I learned to meditate and. Uh, you know, during those you know months at uh, the temple, I was quite you know keen on asking the monks, you know, why did you become a monk? You know, was LSD important in your becoming a Buddhist monk? <laughs> and every one of those junior monks, all in their twenties, like me, uh, uh, you know, they all said, we got our first flash of enlightenment on LSD, and we wanted to you know take it deeper. Um, you know, so I also you know learned. Um, to meditate, and went you know back to medical school, found a good you know, psychotherapist, and just you know, kept my mouth shut. Uh, and you know then you know, became a psychiatrist specifically, you know, to study psychedelics. But at uh, the same time, I you know kept it under my hat. So once I completed you know my uh, um, once I completed um, my psychiatric training. Uh, I spent a year learning how to do you know, clinical research and started off you know, looking at melatonin and the pineal gland because of the long, illustrious spiritual you know, history of the pineal. You know, so we uh, you know, performed a you know, very you know, careful study of the human psychopharmacology of melatonin. You know, but it was uh, you know mostly sedating. You know, this was the early 1980s. You know, people were you know just becoming interested in winter depression and light therapy, uh, and it was you know cool to start you know looking at the pineal gland from a scientific point of view. You know, so you know, we established specific endocrine uh, responses you know to melatonin, um, and also it was you know frankly sedating. You know, there were some you know, preliminary studies indicating it had you know, some profound psychoactive properties, but uh, you know, melatonin isn't especially uh, isn't especially psychoactive. Um, so, in the meantime, I had learned about DMT. Well, it's also you know made in the body, and um, I was you know thinking um, 
if we gave DMT to people and it you know, mimicked the uh, you know, characteristics of a spontaneous mystical or religious or you know, meditative state, you know, that would uh, strengthen uh, the hypothesis you know, that naturally occurring uh, you know, DMT, you know, um, which is made in the human body, was responsible for those you know, so-called you know, non-drug states. Uh, we had you know, published a number of melatonin papers. I was established as a you know, uh, established as a uh, clinical researcher, and you know, started working on the paperwork, um, you know, for doing the DMT study. And uh, I'm in around 1988, and it took you know two years. And we gave our first you know dose of DMT in November '90. Um, we you know, gave a lot of DMT you know, to a lot of people. Uh, and I also took very careful you know, bedside notes, um, which is possible you know, with DMT. You can write everything down because uh, you know, it's quite short. Um, and uh, once the you know, volunteers came down, we would you know, chat for about an hour or so, uh, and I would... Uh, you know, document everything you know, that can, went on in the room. Can I can I pause you there for a moment, just to just to ask? Um, there must have been a powerful motive behind your decision to do research specifically with with DMT, and I'm guessing that that was a DMT experience that you had. Please tell us if that is the case, and tell us a little bit about that experience and how it happened. Yeah. Um, well, um, th there's a saying, uh, research is me-search. Uh, so, uh, <laughs> you know, oftentimes, you know, people have a particular experience or an illness or, you know, something or another, and they, you know, want to understand it. You know, so I, you know, was interested in, st in uh, studying psychedelics, uh, and I was interested in the pineal, I was interested in DMT. And uh, I was at a conference in California in 1986, I think, and Terrence McKenna was there. And you know, we s spoke afterwards, and he said, uh, "Well, you're talking about DMT, but you know, do you know anything about DMT?" So I said, "No, but I'd like to learn." And uh, y you know, so I uh, you know went into a small you know room with a number of friends, and uh, you know, Terrence. You know, uh, you know, kind of gave me you know the introductory DMT rap. Um, you know, you know, like this is how you do. Imagine it. that your first DMT trip at the hands of Terence McKenna. I mean, come on, <laughs> it can't get better than that. <laughs> uh, well, so that experience, you know, shook me, you know, to my ontological roots, as it were, uh, and. Um, you know, there were, you know, these beings, which were surprising as hell, and uh, they spoke in a sing-song voice and said, you know, now do you see, now do you see, now do you see, over and over again. And uh, I came down, you know, Terrence, you know, uh, was pleased. There were a number of other, you know, uh, you know friends in their room. Yeah, you know, so we... Uh, you know, said goodbye you know, for the night, but uh, the you know, but the course well, the course had been set uh, as a result of you know that experience. You know, so I actually stopped the melatonin work. You know, gave up a grant, started working on the DMT grant, and then you know the rest is did history. Did you have Did you have to go through a lot of administrative hoops? I mean, this was what 1990 that you started the, the administering DMT. Yeah, with the height of the war on drugs. So, so you must have faced opposition. I would have thought to starting that project. Um, well, it was a two-year process of working with FDA and the DEA, and it was at you know the height of the war on drugs, the, for, the first you know George Bush, you know. But it was interesting. I mean, people wanted to see psychedelics studied in humans again, um, and because our you know background was quite strong scientifically, I was you know working with a research unit. Um, I had a good biostatistician, um, and our study was incredibly modest. You know, could we give DMT to a group of normal volunteers and generate reasonable data? Um, and uh, we used a 
number of rationales to uh, um, you know to justify the study. You know, one is that you know people abuse you know psychedelics. Oh, oh, actually, I should you know tell you you know the backdrop for that story. You know, so I was you know um, I completed you know the melatonin study, and I and you know my mentor. Uh, I'm at the University of New Mexico had passed away. And the future melatonin studies weren't looking all that promising. Um, and I was in California at the time and stopped off at you know, Terrence's house. And uh, <laughs> we spent a day in his library. I don't know if any of you had ever spent you know, time with you know, Terrence in his library. But, you know, but we uh, just you know, hung out all day. And uh, we concluded, get the war on drugs to give uh, DMT to psychedelic users and, you know, monitor, you know, their responses. So that seemed like a pretty good strategy. Um, and uh, I went back to Albuquerque, worked on the protocol. It was, our, you know, funds came from the war on drugs. And it was, and, you know, people, you know, take psychedelics, you know, sometimes, uh, you know, they encounter problems, you know, the pharmacology of, the, of, of those, you know, drugs wasn't that well understood at the time. So, uh, you know, for that reason, um, it was, you know, decided to be you know, scientifically meritorious. So you got the study going, and uh, how many volunteers did you have, roughly? Uh, we studied around, you know, five dozen people, like, you know, 55 or so, and... Uh, you know, most of those you know people got a number of different doses of DMT, small doses, medium ones, and large doses. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and the the typical situation was what that they're on a hospital bed in the University of New Mexico. Yeah, the st the uh, studies took you know, place on the clinical research unit, um, you know, which was in um, which was in uh, the university hospital. Uh, on the fifth floor, experimental chemotherapy for cancer patients took place there. You know, so it was a pretty life and death grim scene. Um, you know, but uh, you would think that injecting you know DMT into people in a hospital on a hospital you know bed in a little room with tubes sticking out of the walls and whatnot would you know be the worst you know possible you know place to do DMT. You know, but uniformly, uh, the volunteers said it, it was the best possible place to do DMT. You, you know, because you know they were completely at our mercy and completely taken care of at the same time. Right. You know, we had a couple of IVs in place. If there were any cardiac problems, there was a response team that could you know get into the room right away. And uh, the you know volunteers you know really wanted to you know feel like we had things covered because you know what was DMT? I mean, you know, nobody really knew. Um, you know, so with regard, you know, to the, you know, setting, um, I was interested in the spiritual, you know, pharmacology of the drug. Like, you know, was the drug inherently spiritual? In other words, was the, you know, pharmacology spiritual with no psychological preparation? There was no education, there was no incense, there was no cozy room. There was no mystical experiences. There were just, you know, no goals at all other than to just hold on, remember everything you can, and get back to me and describe what happened. So, uh, I, well, I uh, you know, prepared, you know, the volunteers, you know, by telling them, you know, three different things. It's, you know, very fast. It's over quickly. You may think you've died, but don't worry. <laughs> um, and in elaboration of the th um, of the third point, I would say there's a couple of ways to respond, you know, to that feeling that you've died. You can panic, or you can say, "Very interesting. What's next?" Uh, you know. So that's you know the um, approach you know that I you know coached you know the volunteers with. This book, ladies and gentlemen. DMT, the spirit molecule. Just as a matter of interest, how many of you in this room have read this book? 
quite a lot. Well, those of you who hadn't read it yet, I urge you to do so, because this is a phenomenal study, which really changes our views on, on everything. Rick, I want to read you, one of the things that I find, I find most exciting about it is uh, the questions it raises over the nature of reality. The, uh, and, and perhaps that was, wasn't even your intention when you went into the project, but it, but it, raises, it raises fundamental questions. But I'm just going to read you a, a couple of lines from one of your volunteers and the, and the experience that she had. Um, that she meets these, you can see in a void of darkness, suddenly beings appeared. They were cloaked like silhouettes. They were glad to see me. They indicated they'd had contact with, with me as an individual before. They seemed pleased that we had discovered this technology. So this, this intrigues me. It's like, um, like here is a technology to communicate with another, another level of reality. Is that, is that possibly what's going on? Have you contemplated that possibility? Or, 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 or uh, is there some, some... I mean, meeting intelligent beings who communicate with us, in what, it's an experience, and, and they're saying, they're almost saying, great, you've discovered the technology that makes this communication easier. And I, I, I suspect that wasn't perhaps the only volunteer who, who, who said that. No, no. I mean, it was an astonishingly you know, frequent account or report is yeah. that, um, you know, there were beings, they communicated, they had things to say, there was a exchange back and forth. Um, you know, one other volunteer made the analogy of a new technology. Uh, it was interesting. He uh, spoke, well, um, so he, you know, came in for a number of different exposures to DMT, like a week apart, a month apart. Um, and instead of it being a continuation of one, you know, of one experience uh, uh, to the next, um, he described it as, you know, dipping in, you know, to that reality, which uh, a couple of you know weeks had elapsed from you know one you know contact you know to the next, you know. So it was as if things had occurred in that parallel level of reality which, um, you know, were, you know, going on, you know, without, uh, without uh, um, his knowledge with... Um, it was like that reality was continuing separate from the, uh, the, the volunteers' observations of it. Right. It was like, you know, going to Los Angeles in June and yeah. then going to Los Angeles in July. Right. Yeah, as, a, as, as opposed, you know, to th it you know, being a, a you know, consecutive, you know, mm -hmm. kind of an experience. Mm -hmm. Because in another, I'm going to quote you now uh, and your analogy between um, uh, Channel Normal and Channel DMT. Uh, so, n no longer is the show we are watching everyday reality, channel normal. DMT provides regular, repeated, reliable access to other channels. And you go on to talk about how there almost appear to be freestanding planes of existence. And then you say, and this is radical, these words, these worlds are usually invisible to us and our instruments and are not accessible using our normal state of consciousness. However, just as likely as the theory that these worlds exist quote, only in our minds, unquote, is that they are in reality, quote, outside us, unquote, and freestanding. If we simply change our brain's receiving abilities, we can comprehend and interact with them. Now, you wrote that some years ago. How do you feel about that view of things now? Um, yeah, it's a, a very you know, complicated question. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it's a very you know, complicated issue. Um, especially, you know, when it comes to the beings, like, uh, are these beings, you know, somewhere out there, or you know, somewhere in here, or some combination thereof? Um, you know, so the most, uh, you know, the easiest explanation is it's your brain on drugs. Um, you know, there are you know certain parts of your brain which are stimulated you know, by the drug itself. You know, visual centers, emotional centers, auditory centers, and you know those are responsible, you know, for the visions and particularly the beings. You know, but um, in the beginning of my study, I was of the mind of it's your brain on drugs too. And uh, even though I was open-minded you with the volunteers about their reports, I think my skepticism bled through some, and they began closing down some. So I. 
uh, decided to do a you know, thought experiment and say, okay, they went to another level of reality and let's just you know, see where that goes and then after I'm finished with the study, I can you know, figure out you know, some way to explain that. Um, you know, one of the most uh, striking elements of the DMT experience is the you know, feeling of reality. It feels more real than real. You know, so that makes you wonder, well, upon what do we you know, base our you know, sense of um, reality? If, if you, you know, posit, well, you know, there's a you know, part of the brain which is responsible for reality orientation and it's stimulated at a you know, certain kind of you know, baseline um, kind of level, you know, like right now, for example. You know, but uh, if you, you know, take DMT, is that part of the brain even more stimulated? If that's the case, then, oh, and uh, which gets kind of weird because you know, DMT is actively transported into the brain um, uh, across the blood-brain barrier using oxygen, which is a... Uh, uh, um, using energy, um, w which is a, an extremely unusual uh, occurrence. Uh, um, the brain only uh, uh, will transport things into its confines which are required for normal function, for like you know sugar and certain amino acids. You know, so DMT is actively transported into the brain, uh, which indicates or suggests that a certain amount of DMT is necessary for normal brain function, which is, you know, normal consciousness. Um, and if, you know, part of what, you know, DMT, if, you know, part of what, you know, DMT is doing is, you know, maintaining our, you know, feeling um, of reality, you know, then when you give, you know, more DMT, it feels, you know, more, uh, you know, it, you know, feels even more real. Except it doesn't look like this reality. No, no, uh, not generally. Uh, so <laughs> um, it it you know starts to you know beg the question about you know what is real is is you know this all a you know low level DMT experience and when you are on a lot higher dose of DMT, do things break down and you enter into the next level? Another very interesting area that you that you touched on, which continues to be a broad pub public interest today, is the UFO abduction experience, uh, and that you found uh, striking similarities between the volunteers' reports of their experiment. We know they were not being physically abducted because they were on a hospital bed in the University of New Mexico, but their experience, in many cases, was very comparable to the experiences of uh, of UFO abductees. Um, what do you make of, of, of all that? Um, w w when I began the, st the uh, study, I interviewed some uh, you know, friends, you know, colleagues, uh, you know, contacts that had used DMT before, um, I think around you know, 20 people, um, you know, called them, you know, met with them. And uh, you know, this was in order you know, to establish you know, some kind of you know, baseline expectations about you know, what might occur. And I would say almost everybody described the you know, being encounter. And so I thought, OK, there's a being encounter. A lot of you know, people describe that. But, but still, I was completely unprepared for the frequency with which our you know, volunteers reported that. Um, and I was, you know, forced to start, you know, thinking about, you know, the, uh, um, th the abduction literature. I, I wasn't interested in it at all. It seemed kind of flaky, uh, you know, UFOs and whatnot. You know, like about one third, one half, you know, through this study, um, I met with, you know, John Mack, um, who, you know, published a book. I think it was called, was it called Contact? Yeah. Yeah, you know, so I started, you know, describing the experiences of our volunteers and, you know, John said, you've discovered something. Um, but uh, even then I was, you know, reluctant and I still am kind of reluctant to, you know, think of these, you know, things as, you know, creatures, you know, from outer space. They, you know, more, you know, reside, you know, within us or we're only able, um, you know, to perceive them you know, through our own minds. Well, what about, it's not so much a question of creatures from, from outer space, and I, I'll go into this a bit in my talk later, but that different cultures at different times may construe these experiences in different ways. And, and in our culture, we're construing it as abductions by, 
abduction by aliens. I, I think one proposition that was put forward is that, is that perhaps UFO abductees are people who spontaneously overproduce uh, DMT. And just if I might add to that, from my reading of you, you're then not going on to say that does not mean their experience is not real. Uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a real experience, um, but, uh, but in some way mediated by, by DMT. Uh, yeah, I think that I, I think you know, that is the case. I mean, if if you read you know, the literature of you know, the abduction experience, um, you, you know, like oftentimes individuals are really stressed at uh, um, um, at uh, um, the time of you know, their encounter, and in studies of lower animals, levels of DMT increase with stress. You know, the beginning of an encounter, you know, sounds like the beginning of a DMT trip. You know, there's inner pressure, you know, there's a you know, high-pitched, uh, um, you know, sound which, you know, builds, you know, in a, you know, crescendo. It, you know, peaks with the, you know, with the contact experience. Um, you know, so, you know, there were, you know, quite a few overlapping, you know, features of the two you know, syndromes, as it were. Uh, I've I've certainly experienced that myself with with DMT, both in vape form and and in in ayahuasca. Uh, that 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 sense that sense of an an imminent abduction that you're going to be taken away into into another realm. And it's a fa it raises it raises fascinating questions about about what this whole life experience that we're that we're living is. Yeah, well, uh, um, uh, to the extent that, you know, the DMT experience, you know, resembles um, non, you know, drug, you know, syndromes, it, 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 you know, makes a lot of sense, you know, to assume that there is a, you know, common, yeah. uh, uh, a, you know, common, you know, biological underpinning. And that's, and that then also is the same with, with death, and that's why, that's why you speak of it as the as, as the spirit molecule in a way, I think. And and you mentioned to me, off stage, that there's a there's a new study not yet published, which which is I in indicating. Well, go ahead and tell us about this new study. Yeah. Um, w well, one of the uh, um, w one of um, the gratifying uh, experiences, you know, with uh, the DMT work. Is I speculate about a you know couple of you know things in the DMT book, the Spirit Molecule. You know, one is you know that the pineal gland produces or at least contains DMT, and you know that book came out in you know, 2000. And in uh, 2013, there was a group in the University of M of Michigan, you know that is which established you know that there is you know, DMT in uh, the living rodent pineal gland. You know, so, you know, 13 years later, you know, they confirmed, you know, that theory. And uh, one other uh, speculative, you know, hypothesis um, that I present in the book is that, you know, DMT increases at the time of death. And um, the same, uh, you know, research you know, group in Ann Arbor is, you know, looking at the dying rodent brain. And, uh, you know, these are unpublished you know, data right now. Uh, you know, but it does um, you know, seem as if, you know, levels of DMT increase in the dying rodent brain. And if that's the case, you would then, uh, you know, be able to propose a, you know, fairly... Um, you know, tidy, you know, picture of what occurs in the NDE. Um, you know, there are some studies in Eastern Europe, you know, from Hungary, you know, which indicate that in a test tube anyway, if you starve neurons, you know, for oxygen, they begin to die. But if you add some DMT to that mix, it really slows down the destruction of those, um, of those, um, of those brain cells. Uh, you know, so, you know, DMT is neuroprotective in the dying brain. You know, so if you're dying, um, your brain is being starved of oxygen, you know, DMT is released, you experience these visions. Um, you know, but that, you know, kind of, you know, begs the question, you know, why DMT? And, you know, why would the brain, you know, secrete a, a you know, psychedelic, you know, compound as a, um, 
you know, neuroprotective agent as opposed to a, you know, sedating one where everything gets black and warm and, you know, fuzzy and you die. But instead it's this, you know, uh, completely, uh, uh, you know, psychedelic experience. You know, so you could start to think about, well, that's what your subjective awareness is, you know, conscious of as you die. You know, so that is what occurs as you die in your mind. You know, and if, you know, but, you know, what occurs afterwards, obviously, is anybody's, you know, guess because you no longer have a brain. There's, you know, you know there isn't any longer DMT. Uh, you know, one of the, you know, reasons that I stopped doing my study was the Buddhist, you know, monastery that I had been working with for 22, 23 years uh, started to, you know, chafe under the stress of my discussing the, you know, similarities, you know, between the flash of enlightenment that occurs on, you know, drugs and the flash of enlightenment which occurs through meditation. And, you know, one of the issues that I was interested in, and I, you know, spoke with them over the years was, if DMT is released at the time of death, you know, maybe you could give DMT to people as a dry run. Um, you could prepare them. And the monks said, you know, what if it isn't anything at all like the DMT experience? Uh, which would be, you know, doing a, you know, which, you know, could be, you know, potentially, you know, causing some confusion at the time of death. You know, but um, these um, studies, you know, coming out of Michigan indicate that, you know, perhaps, you know, levels of brain, you know, DMT are increasing as you die, and that may um, indeed, you know, be what happens. You know, the obvious uh, study, which I'm, you know, surprised is still, you know, not been done, is you, is you, you know, find, you know, people that have had an NDE, give them DMT, and you say, how, you know, similar are they? And a few you know, people have emailed me, and they said, I had an NDE, I've done DMT, and they're spitting images of each other. You know, but it's you know, got to be a you know, more you know, rigorous kind of design, I think. So uh, you and Andrew Gallimore, and I have the privilege of, of knowing Andrew as well, have, have um, developed a technology, or are in the process of developing a technology, which would allow volunteers to be maintained in the DMT state potentially forever. <laughs> any, any, anybody who's taken, when, when, I, when I mentioned this to Joe Rogan, he said, sign me up. <laughs> but uh, uh, anybody who's, who's, who's experienced DMT would, would have to regard that as a formidable proposition. What's, what's, your, what's your thoughts on this? And will this go somewhere? And I think there's some interest from Imperial College in London in, in deploying right. this. Yeah. Um, w w um, one of our experiments in Albuquerque you know, was to determine if you know, people develop you know, tolerance you know, to repeated doses of DMT. Um, you know, for example, if you take LSD every day, you really stop responding after about three days. Uh, you know, mescaline, you know, psilocybin, you know, that's the case. You know, so the, you know, that's called tolerance. Um, you become you know, tolerant. And if you want you know, the same experience, you, you know, need to increase the dose uh, you know, to get the same effect. Um, and you know, there, were, you know, there was one study in humans where it was given t you know, twice a day and you know, there was no tolerance. There was one study in rodents where it was given every two hours for three weeks and uh, there was no tolerance. You know, so I said, well, you got to give it more closely spaced together. Um, you know, so we gave, you know, four doses of, you know, DMT in the space of a morning. And uh, so the intervals were a half hour. You know, so we gave, you know, one dose at 8, 8.30, 9, 9.30, 10 um, in the morning. And, uh, you know, there was no tolerance, you know, number one, which was a, you know, remarkable finding. Um, and, you know, number two is... Uh, that the you know, volunteers were able to do a lot more you know, psychological you know, work uh, under that you know, kind of a regimen. Um, you know, usually if you smoke DMT, you just you know, hold on to your hats and uh, you can't really you know, work with it all that much. You know, once you get your bearings, you start coming down. Um, you know, but you know, with this repeated you know, dosing you know, protocol, you know, people you know, could you know, work on stuff, or um, at least encounter stuff, you know, then come down, and it was a s slightly smaller, you know, dose than our maximal dose. 
you know, so, you know, we had some time to talk, you know, 10 minutes or so as, you know, they're getting ready for their next dose. Um, and, you know, people were able, you know, to work on stuff like career, love life, spiritual uh, questions. Um, and it was, you know, quite interesting. It went, you know, through, you know, kind of a uh, stereotyped, uh, uh, you know, sequence. The, you know, first experience was big and great. You know, the, you know, the second experience was a, you know, continuation of that. You know, the third experience, uh, you know, people were just burned out. They said, uh, you know, this is, you know, too much. I'm struggling, the, all this unresolved stuff. And I, you know, think I want to quit. Has anybody ever quit after the third dose? And I would say, not yet. <laughs> and, you know, so they would do, you know, the fourth dose. And, um... You, you know, yeah, you know, they didn't want to be the you know first one who you know just you know couldn't do it, but you know, but uh, that you know fourth and you know final dose was just a breakthrough for a lot of the you know the, you know for uh, you know lots of the volunteers, you know. So I you know started thinking, well, wouldn't it be you know great if you could keep somebody in that state, you know, go up with the rate of infusion, you know, go down with it, you know, or you know bring people com completely out of it? It would be an extremely useful and extremely novel psychotherapeutic tool, or even a spiritual tool. You know, so I, um, you know, make that, uh, well, in the spirit molecule, I, you know, make that suggestion that in the future it would be uh, of interest, you know, to develop a continuous infusion kind of a model, you know, where you just, you know, keep, you know, people in the DMT state, you could crank it up, you could crank it down. Um, and uh, yeah, one of um, one of my colleagues, Andrew um, Gallimore, uh, is a you know neuroscientist in Japan, and uh, you know worked out a model like a you know mathematical model. You begin with a big dose, you, you drop it, um, you you know calculate this and you calculate that. It was a you know it is a you know rather sophisticated pharmacokinetic um, you know design. Um, that paper came out maybe you know, two years ago or so, and uh, there is a group at Imperial College in London that's been giving DMT and doing brain scans, and uh, you know they're you know working on actually implementing the continuous infusion study, which will be unbelievably interesting. Yeah, I think the consequences, the results of that could be could could be extraordinary. Yeah, you know, one of the strong points of a study like that is you could spend time in the DMT state, and you can explore it, and you could, you know, learn what the, you know, what the beings, well, you could start to, you know, characterize, you know, the nature and, you know, the role of the beings, uh, you know, because you would, you know, be able to spend an extended uh, amount um, of time with them. Uh, and, you know, one of... Um, you know, one of the you know, possible ex experiments that a few people um, have proposed, which would you know help establish you know the reality of the beings, is you know to ask them a question that is impossible you know for a human to answer, like the square root of some massive number, and if you know the beings are able you know to give you the answer, I mean, wouldn't that be something? You know, but, you know, even if the beings were real, there's no guarantee that they'd be interested in answering your question. Yeah. Or they might be tricky. Or they, <laughs> you know, might be tricky, which, you know, they usually are. Yeah. You know, they're mischievous and they're, you know, kind of malevolent at times if yeah. you're not careful. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Rick, I want to move on to your, to f further aspects of your, of, of, of your work and, and your next, your next book in this field was, was DMT and the Soul DMT and the Soul of Prophecy, uh, and and in this book uh, you have also had a long-term interest in the Hebrew Bible and in prophecy in the Hebrew Bible, and somehow you bring these you bring these notions together. Tell us a bit about this 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 book. Um, yeah, uh, DMT and the Soul of Prophecy. Uh, well, I, I completed I, I completed my studies in uh, you know 1995. Mm, you, you know, wrapped up those you know projects for a couple of reasons. Well, actually, you know, more than uh, you know more than a couple. Um, you know, we had uh, you know begun uh, you know doing some studies giving psilocybin, 
uh, at the time. You know, some dose, you know, finding work, uh, you know, with our um, you know, volunteers from the DMT study. You know, um, what, when I was a resident and uh, I was being, you know, trained in, you know, giving antipsychotic drugs, antidepressants, things like that, um, m my supervisors always said, you know, give slightly too much and then back down, at which point you know the maximal response to the drug. Um, and, you know, that's you know, what we did, you know, with the DMT work. You know, we gave a, a, you know, a couple of the volunteers an overdose um, and we, you know, lowered it a bit, which you know, then became our high dose. You know, so we gave, you know, people massive doses of psilocybin, 1.1 1 .1, uh, you know, milligrams uh, per kilogram. If you look at, you know, the current, uh, uh, the, you know, current, you know, psilocybin studies, you know, taking place at Hopkins and NYU, you know, they call a, a large dose or, or, you know, their maximal dose is, uh, you know, 0 0.45. You know, so ours was at least uh, was at least uh, you know twice as high as what is you know now you know being considered a high dose of you know psilocybin. Uh, you know, the, uh, so those you know kinds of uh, of you know doses you know caused a delirium. Uh, you know, the two you know volunteers were red and sweaty and confused, disoriented. You know, so we you know figured, and you know they both said this is too much. You just can't give this dose to anybody. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, so we backed down, and our, you know, high dose, you know, would have been, uh, uh, you know, 0 0.9 um, milligrams you know, per kilogram, which is still, you know, twice what is, you know, considered a large dose now. And, you know, what's even more interesting is in our, you know, volunteers, um, you know, the threshold, you know, for psilocybin being at a threshold dose, a, you know, breakthrough psychedelic dose, it wasn't until, you know, 0 0.4 or, um, you know, like around, um, well, like around that dose. Uh, you know, so, you know, what is um, being, you know, called a you know, high dose of, psilos of, you know, psilocybin nowadays was, our you know threshold you know dose uh, you, you know for establishing a you know full psychedelic effect. You know we also got you know permission to start an LSD study and we got the drug. But um, you know by then I had answered you know my question like is you know DMT inherently spiritual? And with our you know preparations, uh, you know people were just you know more of themselves. You know, they, you know, didn't, uh, you know, the one enlightenment experience in our, you know, subjects um, was a doctor um, who was a religious uh, studies major in college, and he really wanted an enlightenment experience, and he had one. You know, there was a nurse in our study that was really interested in NDEs, and, you know, she really wanted one, and, you know, she had one. Uh, you know, there was a, you know, programmer in our group who, was obviously always, you know, living in, uh, you know, zeros and ones. And on his, you know, DMT trip, he, you know, saw the, you know, source of information in, you know, zeros and ones. You know, so the, the you know, notion that you could just, you know, give a drug and, you know, cause a spiritual experience was, you know, disproven, um, at least in our study. Um, it, you know, depends on the person depends on their expectations, depends on the material that the DMT is, you know, working on. Um, you know, Stan Groff uh, used to call LSD a nonspecific mental amplifier. And, and I think um, if you don't spend a lot of time preparing people to have a particular kind of experience, then they will just become, you know, more of themselves or the goals or aspirations or their, you know, thoughts which are, you know, more or less conscious become displayed in, you know, full relief and they become convinced of its truth, you know, the reality, you know, the meaning of, you know, those ideas which may have been um, a little less clear beforehand. 
you know, so I was a little discouraged. Like I was, you know, it was kind of naive, but I just had to, you know, prove it to myself. Like, is DMT inherently spiritual? And I was kind of hoping it would be, and it, you know, turned out, you know, not to be. Uh, but, but still, um, you know, the reality uh, experience, you know, the strong um, experience of reality of you know the DMT world and it's just bizarre in nature it's just you know it's it's you know reliably bizarre uh you know nature was uh it, it was extremely perplexing um and uh i wasn't pleased with any of the models that i had you know brought to bear on that you know research originally um you know those were three uh Perspectives, you know, one was the "this is your brain on drugs," you know, psychopharmacology model. Um, the, the, the other um, was a uh, um, you know psychoanalytic model, like you know these are un, you know, conscious you know, conflicts and impulses um, and drives, which are then you know made uh, you know conscious. You know, the other you know was the Buddhist model, you know, like you know this is. Um, you, you know the progression of your mind towards the enlightened state, which is you know completely, um, which is you know completely empty, empty of uh, form, feeling, consciousness, perception, understanding. You know, but you know nobody really went into that enlightened state other than that one, uh, you know, uh, that one volunteer I uh, had mentioned. You know, so those you know models really weren't that useful. The you know biological you know model you know just seemed a little too simple. Like and you know when I would be speaking with the volunteers about you know what they had just undergone and they would say, you know, how did this happen? And I would say, oh, it's your brain on drugs and they'd say there is no way this could be my brain on drugs. It feels real. It's more, you know, real than anything that I've ever experienced. You know the Buddhist, you know, model, you know, the Zen model, anyway, would you know disparage the you know content, which is you know full in the DMT experience. Uh, there's beings, there's light, there's information, there's colors, there's emotions, there's thoughts, um, and you know Buddhism as a rule, anyway. You know the Tibetans put more you know credence into those phenomena, but you know the Zen you know model that I was you know working with. Uh, would you know consider all the meat of the experience as ephemeral, you know, kind of um, you know it isn't you know really the main thing, and the you know psychoanalytic model also describes the experiences as as you know something other than what they seem to be. This uh, you know conflict or you 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 know love your mother, hate your father, you know those those you know those kinds of things. You know, so I went, you know, back to the drawing board and thought, well, I, you know, need to develop a, a stronger model, one that, you know, fits the data better. You know, so I started to um, explore, you know, some of, you know, the ideas of, you know, modern physics, parallel universes, dark matter, those kinds of things. You know, and, you know, number one, I'm, you know, no expert in that field. And, you know, number two, even if you described, you know, the mechanisms, you know, um, you know, by which you might encounter or apprehend normally um, invisible, you know, layers of um, reality, you know, what does it mean? What's the importance? You know, what's the relevance? Um, you know, it, is it going to make us any, you know, kinder as a species or smarter as a species or more compassionate. Um, you know, so I switched, you know, perspectives and I thought, you know, what else, you know, what other disciplines, you know, look at altered states of consciousness and extract useful information, you know, from them. And, you know, clearly, you know, you, uh, you know, those are, you know, the religious models, you know, the religious disciplines. And I, you know, kind of went, you know, through the Buddhist, um, you know, model, uh, which, you know, wasn't especially satisfactory. They, they excommunicated you, didn't they? <laughs> uh, they, of. yeah, I was no longer, you know, welcome after, uh, you know, f you know, formal committee was convened to um, investigate, you know, what I was, you know, talking about. Right. Right. Yeah, you know, so that happens even in Zen. I, I mean, you know, religious organizations are 
very interested in you know maintaining the the status quo and you know their own uh, you know territoriality. Um, yeah, you know, so that was a you know sorry uh, you know chapter in the book. Uh, um, I actually uh, you know call it stepping on holy toes, uh, you know, because it you know it was you know clearly the case that almost all of those monks got their first you know taste of enlightenment on psychedelics, and you know to not to be able to you know talk about it openly seemed quite you know it was you know it was. Uh, you know, quite hypocritical. And it also flies in the face of, you know, scientific discourse. Like, you know, one of the uh, strengths of, you know, the scientific model is you can disagree with each other uh, without being excommunicated. Uh, I suppose you can be. I Unless mean, they're archaeologists. <laughs> uh, uh, right. Uh, more astronomers. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, you, you know, so it was like, okay, I can't be a Buddhist anymore, but, uh, you know, there ought to be other, you know, religions out there which could, you know, provide a good model. You know, so I'm Jewish, and uh, I figured, well, you know, what's in the Hebrew Bible? Uh, so I stopped meditating because I just couldn't stand looking at my cushion uh, for, uh, actually, for, uh, you know, a couple of years. Um, yeah, and I, you know, went into a New Age bookstore in Port Townsend. I don't know if any of you have, you know, been up to Port Townsend, Washington, but but it's this huge, you know, New Age, you know, metaphysical bookstore. You know, so there's, you know, stacks and stacks of, you know, books on Hinduism and Buddhism and Confucianism. And it's like, okay, I've, you know, like, okay, that's, you know, I don't really, you know, need to, uh, you know, look, you know, there anymore. And upstairs was a small, small, you know, section um, on Judaism. And, uh, you know, there was an even smaller book called The Kabbalah of Envy, um, you know, by a, uh, you know, rabbi from Brazil. And it was a really great little book. It was an introduction to, you know, thinking about interactions as spiritual tools, as opposed, you know, to the enlightened, unitive, mystical experience, you know, where all is one. The you know model you know that you know this guy was presenting you know was you know that you work out things spiritually in your every in in your everyday interactions, and he you know talks about a story in the Talmud about a couple of you know farmers who were arguing over tools. You know one guy you know wanted to borrow a expensive tool one guy was interested in you know borrowing an inexpensive tool and he then describes how the, you know there's revenge there's a grudge um, there's you know jealousy there's greed there's envy and the fine you know detail of the interactions was just amazing it was uh, it 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 you know was as if spiritual truths could be revealed in everyday interactions between two farmers arguing about tools. You know, so I, I thought, well, and it it, it it was interesting, you know, because when I first began, you know, reading Buddhism, it took me a long, you know, time to understand, like, a sentence. I might have to, you know, look at it for a few hours. And, uh, you know, when I stumbled on this other approach, you know, to reality, it was, you know, the same thing. Like, I could not understand the difference between revenge and a grudge. And I couldn't understand the difference between envy and, uh, um, you know, as, as, as compared to jealousy. But, you know, once I started to understand that, it, you know, seemed like a rich, uh, rich place to look. And, uh, you know, what I like to do is, you know, look at other people's, you know, sources. So I thought, well, you know, where is, you know, this guy getting his information from? Um, you know, um, and as you know, the Bible, you know, the Hebrew Bible, you know, the so-called Old Testament. Um, yeah, you know, so um, I began, you know, to read the Bible, you know, the Hebrew Bible. You know, when I when I was younger, I you know went to Hebrew school for a number of hours every couple of days after public school, and and I learned conversational Hebrew. 
uh, we didn't really, you know, learn that much about God other than, you know, God, you know, uh, you know, was involved in history, obviously. Um, you know, you know, with the end of the Holocaust, the establishment of the state of Israel. You know, but you know, what was God's nature? You know, how do you communicate with God? What are God's characteristics? We really never discussed that. You know, but at uh, the same time, um, I had some in intimations of spiritual, you know, feelings. You know, you know, within uh, the tradition. Um, you know, folk dancing. We sp spun around on stage uh, to extremely, you know, high energy. Uh, you know, folk songs. Um, we sang. Um, you know, folk songs. Um, we prayed at the top of our lungs. You know, like uh, you know, make the you know, chandeliers sway. Our instructor, you know, told us. You know, um, you know, sing that loud. Um, and you know, I swear we were able to make the, you know the chandeliers swing. You know, but after I was, you know, bar misfit, as you know, most you know people, I just you know dropped it, went into the you know Buddhist thing for a couple of you know decades. You know, you know, um, you know, but I knew Hebrew, or I used to know Hebrew. You know, so if you're going to be you know reading a spiritual you know text, you want you know to read it in its original language. You know, for a number of reasons, um, you can do your own translation. And any translation is an interpretation. Um, you know, so if you're able, you know, to read the Hebrew yourself, you can do your own interpretations, you know, with the aid of, you know, the commentaries. You know, but also, you know, the um, original, you know, language has got spiritual power. You know, so if you're reading the old text or if, if uh, you're reading, you know, the text in Hebrew, out loud especially, you can you know resonate with the mind that wrote those words in the first place, you know. So it would be an intimation of you know the prophetic state, you know. So I, you know, began with you know Genesis in the beginning. You know, God you know created the heavens and the earth, which took a few months actually for me to get you know my head around, you know, because of the you know the whole you know notion of God as a you know creator, you know. So I. You know, started to work. You know, through the text, it you know took eleven years to you know read the um, entire you know, Hebrew Bible with a number of uh, the you know classic you know commentaries. Um, and uh, you know, once I was able to establish some understanding of the text, the notion of the prophetic experience began to appear. Um, as a spirit, as a when spiritual. We, when experience. we talk prophets, let's let's give some familiar names. We're talking. I mean, Moses is a prophet. Daniel is is a prophet. Right, right. Well, you know, there's you know the canonical prophets, yeah. uh, which have got you know books that, that you know that are named after them, like Isaiah, Jeremiah, and yeah. Ezekiel. You know, Daniel. Um, you know, but I expand. You know, the um, you know the definition when. You you know hear the word you know, prophecy. Most you know, people th um, um, you know, think about you know, foretelling, you know, predicting, you know. But that is an artifact of the translation from the Hebrew into Greek, which was the first you know non you know Jewish you know translation. Um, you know, so, um, so the Hebrew w word um, you know, for the prophet is navi, and I am in a you know, vi. And and uh, the um, and uh, the Greek you know translation was prophetes, which means you know to see ahead, or you know to see in the future, which reflects the interest in the Greeks and the whole you know you know concept of uh, you know the concept of you know divining you know divination would be you know to foretell. You know, so the interest of the Greeks in you know foretelling established the word you know, prophecy. Right. Yeah. Um, are you are you then suggesting that the Hebrew prophets were in a DMT state in some way? I I, 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 I call to mind the work of um, Benny Shannon and his uh, his study of of ayahuasca, the 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 antipodes of the mind, and and his I think he specifically suggests that 
Moses at the burning bush may have been under the influence of an ayahuasca analog, uh, which would be, I think, if I recall correctly, Syrian ruin mimosa hostilis. Um, is that your line, or are you, or or is it some, some in some significant way different from that? Yeah. Um, well, there's a couple of you know, points. You know, one is the you know presence of you know DMT in the human body precludes the need to locate its you know source. Um, in the environment, true. Um, yeah. yeah, you know, so it it you know could be in plants, might be in you know the manna, uh, you know, could be in you know whatever, you know. But you know, the human body contains DMT, and you know levels increase in you know certain uh, in um, you know certain you know conditions. Um, you know, to return you know to my definition of the prophetic experience. As opposed to it including or you know requiring you know prediction, you know my um, you know my definition is is it's um, any spiritual experience you know by anyone in the Hebrew Bible, you know so it could be uh, it it you know could be Hagar um, you know the you know mother of Ishmael um, who encounters an angel by the well. You know, so you know, most people don't. You know, you know, most people don't. You know, think of her when you think about a prophet. You know, but um, if an individual in the you know text has a you know dream which comes true, you know, that is a you know prophetic experience. Um, if you know somebody is inspired to be a great you know warrior, like you know the spirit of you know God, you know would just would you know drop upon you know somebody and you know they would become strong and courageous. You know that is a uh, you, you know kind of um, spiritual experience. Uh, you know it's a you know subtype of you know the prophetic state. Um, and you know the whole you know text is a you know prophetic you know text. It was written under some divine inspiration or you know some kind of inspiration, which would be included in my you know, definition of the prophetic experience. So, so to cut to the chase, are you saying that, um, that the prophets are, are those individuals who, who are over producing more DMT than the average person in the street does? Or is that oversimplifying your message? Um, well, you know, once I began working, um, you know, th once, once I you know, began to you know, look at you know, the Hebrew Bible carefully, uh, I began to think, well, I wonder what the degree of overlap is between the DMT experience and the you know, classic you know, prophetic experience. You know, so I started to compare the reports in the Bible with the reports of my DMT volunteers. And there is extraordinarily close overlap. I mean, if you read chapter one of Ezekiel, there's, you know, there's you know, beings with wings, with eyes on their wings and eyes on their backs. He flies through space. He falls down. There's a, you know, whooshing, you know, sound uh, in the beginning. He's standing, you know, next to water. Uh, he's weak. He asks, you know, questions. He's uh, completely, you know, blown away. There's like a, you know, firmament of blue and ice. Uh, there's flames. There's spinning wheels. There's spinning globes. It's completely DMT-like. Um, you know, so you know, the phenomenology is quite, you know, similar. You know, so you know, then you would be you know forced to start to think. Well, is it the case that these spontaneous prophetic states are mediated through the increase of endogenous DMT? You know, the you know the obvious you know difference between the prophetic and the DMT state is its impact. Uh, the you know, prophets lived three thousand years ago. People still read them. They're inspired by them. Uh, you know, perennial knowledge or, you know, perennial wisdom perhaps, as it were. <coughs> perhaps people will be reading Rick Strassman in 3,000 years. <laughs> <laughs> you know, so it's, you know, the content of the state, which I think is key. It isn't just, you know, the phenomenology. It's, you know, the content. You know, what is, you know, the message that is being conveyed, you know, by the, you know, by the phenomenology. You know, so that, you know, leads, you know, uh, you know to the metaphysical you know, theories, you know, regarding, you know, the prophetic state, the imagination, and, you know, the intellect, which gets, you know, it, I mean, uh, you really start, you know, getting deep in the weeds, but uh, I think it's an important 
thing to know about and you know to learn about. Yeah, um, I want to give the audience <coughs> the opportunity to ask some questions, but but and time time is running out, but we must not. We must not stop without um, also mentioning a, a new development in Rick's writing career. Uh, there's a curious parallel here because I, I, I'm known for writing nonfiction, but I've also written some some novels. And Rick has written a novel, which is, I suspect, largely biographical in some ways. It's called Joseph Levy Escapes Death, uh, and I'm here to massively and highly recommend this book. This is a fantastic piece of writing and is deeply, deeply thought-provoking. And uh, I would like you to talk about it and what led you to it and, and what, what your objectives are with it. Uh, yeah, it's a strange book. Well, I, I mean, all my books are strange. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you know, consider the source, right? Uh, well, well, you know, so this cover. Uh, well, I, 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 I um, spent a year in in uh, in uh, 2014, you know, being both you know sick and recovering, you know, from being sick, and I spent a lot of time lying on my couch, looking at the window at these birds at the feeder, um, you know. So if it weren't for these birds at the feeder, I mean, this book never would have happened. Um, yeah, well, um, it's what's called autobiographical fiction. I found out later. Uh, it's experiences, you know, which I had, you know, feelings which I had, you know, thoughts which I had, um, encounters, you know, relationships, you know, which I had, which are, you know, filtered, you know, through this, you know, personality of, you know, Joseph Levy. Um, and it's pretty dark, but it's pretty funny. Uh, it's, a both, it's, a, it's a dark and funny book. Yeah, both, 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 both things. And, and, and also, and also deeply deeply thought provoking and and uh, re re relate you you went through a tough time i mean i i i didn't realize fully until we talked last night how much this was built on your your own experiences you you really were close to death it was a very twice yeah 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 it was grim yeah uh you know but it worked out uh mm. I, <laughs> I lived and i got my health back how do you feel about writing fiction? How do you compare to writing factual nonfiction books? Uh, well, you know, this was close to home. Yeah. You know, so I worked out my PTSD big time writing this book. Right. Uh, because it was pretty traumatic, yeah. uh, and it was hard to think about, hard to write about. You know, so in you know that way, it was both you know good, it was helpful, but it was also rather difficult. But uh, one thing I like about you know fiction is you don't have to worry about references. Yeah, <laughs> such a relief. <laughs> and like, w if you're going to be writing about the Bible, you really want to make certain you've got your chapter and your verse right because yeah. uh, you, it could be a wild goose chase. Uh, yeah, you know. So I like that, um, and it's fun doing dialogue. I learned you know doing dialogue from the DMT book. I you know took all these notes. You know, during the study, and a lot of it, you know, was the dialogue between me and the volunteer. You know, the nurse and the volunteer. You know, the nurse and me. You know, so I started to you know get the hang of dialogue, especially around extreme states and extreme conditions. Um, yeah, you know, so I would embellish. Uh, you know, one of the things that you know, held me in good stead is I've always kept a journal, um, and when I was you know sick uh, in this small hospital. Uh, it was just incredibly, uh, it, it was just, you know, hard to believe, you know, so I... It's really a, the hospital from hell. Yeah. <laughs> That's what's described here. And I thought, well, you know, this is a story, so I should take notes. And if I make, and if I, you know, make it, you know, through this, I'm going to tell the story because it's, a, it's an amazing story. Yeah, you know, so after uh, I came home, um, I came down with, you know, something else, like a super bug. Um, and I, you know, just you know, took notes, and I figured, well, um, I would like to put you know, pen to paper at some point, and you know, tell the story from the perspective of you know, looking at it, you know, from you know, some distance. Well, highly recommended. Please pick up a copy of Rick's book. It's a different aspect of Rick's work, and it's it's in incredibly interesting and hugely hugely worth reading. I'm going to take the 
next uh, at least 10 minutes to see if anybody in the audience would like to ask Rick a question. And I have a microphone here and I'll bring it to you so that others in the audience can hear the question. Uh, yeah, Rick. Uh, Dr. Norman Don at the University of Chicago. We worked with a lot of uh, topographic brain mapping of psychics uh, who were very well known, like Olaf Johnson, to identify the portions of the brain that's active when you have a psi hit. Was there any research done with DMT that did the same type of analysis? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, um, so we did a, a small study with, I think, three or four you know, people uh, you know, giving DMT, and you know, we measured the EEG. But you know, motion artifact is a problem uh, with a high you know dose of DMT. You, you do vibrate. You, you have got a you know very fine tremor, uh, which was reflected in the EEG recording, and we weren't able to you know filter that out very well. You know, we also gave you know DMT to a couple of volunteers in in a scanner, uh, you know, like an MRI scanner. I don't know if anybody has, you know, is, uh, uh, well. What a horrible uh, place to have a DMT experience. <laughs> Incredibly <laughs> clattering, loud noise. Right. I don't know if any of you, you know, have, you know, had an MRI, but it's like a jackhammer. Uh, it's really noisy. But still, when you're on a big dose of DMT, you know, the outside world just, uh, you know, disappears. And, you know, by the time, you know, they came down, uh, you know, they were fine, they were glad to be alive, and uh, the scan continued. You know, we got the data, but it was also, you know, difficult to interpret because of the movement artifact as well. And, you know, that was, you know, back in the early 90s, and uh, the magnets weren't as strong as the magnets are in those machines now, so um, we weren't able to analyze, you know, those data, you know, with any, you know, reasonable quality. Dr. Strassman, thank you for your work. It's been uh, amazing to follow you. Um, one of the things when I've smoked DMT in a group of people, uh, w uh, when I've smoked DMT with a group of people, a couple of times, two times it's happened that I've had uh, group hallucinations of, of entities and beings. And afterwards, when we're done smoking, we all describe it. And oh my gosh, I saw the same thing. Um, without describing the beings, because I'm, I'm sure they can be different for each person. W w what's your um, experience with that and maybe explanation for that? Uh, have, have you come across that? Thank you. Um, yeah, it's a very strange thing, and it is reported. And it's also, you know, common, you know, with ayahuasca, you know, ceremonies that, you know, people in the group will experience the same visions uh, or, you know, see the same thing. Uh, I don't really know how to explain it. Um, you know, one of the, uh, you know, theories, you know, regarding, you know, the prophetic experience is, you know, that there's this, you know, thing up there, which is called the active intellect. It's a sphere. It's, you know, the lowest sphere. Um, you know, there's, you know, nine spheres. You know, the lowest one is the, uh, you know, sublunar one, which is called the active intellect. Um, you know, the, you know, the philosophers, you, you know, believe, you know, that the active intellect, you know, contains every occurrence in the past, every occurrence that's happening now, and every possible occurrence in the future. Um, you know, so it's a, you know, vast repository of information. And you know, their belief about you know, prophecy is that one is able to approximate, become close to, you know, it's, you know, called, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, called conjoining um, um, with the active intellect. And you know, that you know, can occur through an intensification of the imagination when you speak about the imagination in a you know, philosophical, uh, you know, technical sense. You know, so I think what you know, psychedelics are doing is stimulating the imaginative you know, faculty of the mind, which is the you know, source of the visions. You know, so th you know, the active intellect you know, can be conjoined by means of the imagination. So it you know, could be, you know, this is you know, quite you know, metaphysical, but it you know, could be that if you know, DMT is, um, is allowing a conjoining 
with the active intellect of the people in the room, you know, that they're able to, you know, tap in, you know, to the same ongoing experiences or events. Um, okay, I'll take another from this side. Who shall it be? I'll pass it to you. Um, I'm going to an ayahuasca retreat in the Amazon in July, and I was curious if there were any known health risks, and if there's any lasting neurological effects or damage, and if so, how to prepare for such effects? Yeah, that is a good question. Um, w well, you need to be in, in you know, good health, mental health, you know, physical health. Uh, you also need to do your homework. You, um, you need to be prepared. Uh, you ought to look in 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 uh, to the site too. You know, to the retreat center. Uh, you know, find out if it's a you know reputable organization. Any you know bad horror stories which you know have emerged from there. Um, I'd second that. It's re really important that you have some word of mouth on the center you're going to. Others who've been there have had a positive experience because there are, there are some really crappy ayahuasca retreats which are not sincere and not honest and not good. You have to do due diligence, but if you do that, you'll find yourself in a good space. Yeah, um, y you know, prepare, uh, you know, find out, you know, what other people, you know, do to make the most of their experiences. You know, if you're on any medication, you would want to make certain that, uh, you know, it, it won't interact with the ayahuasca. Um, you know, some people, you know, prepare with a diet, you know, they avoid certain foods. You know, uh, you know, concentrate on other ones. Um, you know, get your mental state in order. You, you know, get your meditation, you, you know, practice, you know, solid. If you've got a lot of interpersonal conflicts going on, you know, work it out in counseling first or, you know, get an understanding of what those are. You know, so if they do come up, you've got some you know, preparation and you're not surprised. Um, yeah, I, I, yeah. Okay. In, in, in terms of physical risks from ayahuasca, I, I, would, I would say that the overall volume of research that's been done suggests that they're extremely minimal. So it, it's physically uncomfortable, but the, the likelihood of physical damage being caused is, is very low. You want to make sure your heart is, is good, your liver is good, your kidneys are good. These are all important aspects, but this, this medicine has been used in the Amazon for thousands of years, and, and uh, there's a vast cultural experience behind it. Uh, over on this side. Well, so they've been doing some long-term studies of long-term ayahuasca users, and you know, generally they're smarter and they're healthier and they're you know, better off you know, than controls, you know, both with respect you know, to their relationships, their health, you know, substance abuse, those kinds of things. You know, those are data that have been coming out the last maybe 10 or 15 years. But, but you could still freak out. <laughs> and, and if you do freak out, you want to get help right away. Yeah. Is there anyone in Canada doing DMT research, and how can we volunteer for the extended doses? <laughs> Uh, well, so there aren't any DMT studies in Canada. You know, there's only one that's occurring uh, in the world right now, um, as far as I know, and you know, that's in London at Imperial College. The Imperial you know, College um, is opening up a, a you know, psychedelic research institute, um, specifically you know, dedicated you know, uh, uh, you know, for studying psychedelics. Um, and it's, I think, going to be opening any day now. Um, you know, the person that's spearheading the continuous infusion study is is named uh, you know Dr. Timmerman, um, and uh, you can just you know track him down uh, you know through Imperial College. He's a, he's a very open and accessible guy. You 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 can you can find him and, and email him. Uh, one more question from this side. I'll take it from you over there, sir. Thank you. It's been suggested, um, obviously, that the DMT being produced within the brain in a spontaneous burst could produce a spiritual experience. I have kind of a two-part question, one being, um, has anybody measured the amount of DMT produced within the brain, and does it compare to the psychoactive dose? And then the other part is kind of the chicken or the egg question. Is 
your opinion that the spiritual experience is authentically a spiritual experience and that the chemical signature is just kind of red or is it that the the DMT is the explanation for a spiritual experience? Um, well, in response, you know, uh, in response uh, to your first question, it's extremely difficult uh, to measure levels of endogenous DMT. There are you know picograms you know per mil, like you know billionth of a gram you know, per mil. And uh, I just don't think it's going to be possible with current you know, technology to measure DMT levels going up or down in uh, unusual states of mind, you know, dreams, you know, near-death encounters, let's say. You know, but uh, you know, they've characterized the gene that's responsible you know, for the enzyme which you know, synthesizes DMT. So I think what will be the case in the future is we'll be looking at the activation of the, that enzyme and that gene. Uh, it's being you know, turned on or it's you know, being turned off. Um, with respect you know, to the chicken and the egg question, uh, I think you know, DMT is, you know, is you know, kind of like uh, uh, you know, silicon in chips. It's the, the best you know, candidate for a specific function. Um, so I think that's what is probably you know, going on is you know, that it's an accompaniment. Uh, and it's, you know, it, it's an accompaniment and it's also, you know, necessary. I don't think you can have a DMT experience without DMT. But, you know, whether it's a real spiritual experience, I mean, you can, you know, debate that for a long time. Uh, you know, the, ex yeah, yeah. Um, it you know, could be considered the experience which resembles a spiritual experience. You know, like, um, you know, one of the you know, tendencies in this current wave of research is to call, you know, psilocybin in a you know, research environment a mystical experience. But I think that's kind of fraught because you give somebody a drug after, you know, 10 or, you know, 12 hours of education and you know, preparation, and you, you know, and you, you know, characterize it as, you know, comparable to what might occur after, you know, meditating for, you know, 20 years in a cave or, you know, praying in a cell all by yourself for a long, long time. You know, so I, I think the more, you know, modest way of describing those states would be, you know, mystico-mimetic, perhaps, you know, that they, you know, that they mimic uh, the experience. And, you know, mimicked experiences can be quite close to the real thing, you know, reproductions of, you know, master works of art can be, you know, almost master works of art. So uh, I think it depends on, you know, the quality of the overlap and what you do with it, uh, you know, after it takes place. So ladies and gentlemen, we're now going to take a half hour intermission. Uh, Rick and I will be in a room that I don't know where it is. I hope Robert Dakota is in here or somebody is in here to yes. lead us to that it's, room. It's in the universal room. Okay. The, the signing. All right. Thank you very much, and we'll see you over there. <laughs>